I'll go to the next slide, and uh, as we start going through the plan, it's really an extensive plan. It was released last year uh, by the governor and the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. It's comprehensive in that it covers a lot of subject areas, energy efficiency, uh, electricity, the supply, how we do renewable power, uh, industrial energy needs, transportation, and natural gas. Most of our presentation today is going to focus on that natural gas piece, but just briefly, uh, I'll talk about some of the other topics that the plan addresses. Uh, energy efficiency, what the governor would like to see happen is deeper energy efficiency savings throughout the state. Uh, as many of you know, in Connecticut, we've been energy efficiency leaders for a long time, going back to uh, 2006 and, and even earlier. Um, a lot of the easy energy efficiency uh, measures have been done. Some of the deeper things, that real changes to buildings that will uh, result in higher energy efficiency savings are still out there. And the governor and DEEP are looking for ways to encourage residents, businesses uh, to take advantage of some of these things, which do have a higher cost associated with them, but will have more savings as you go down the road. Uh, so that is one aspect that the plan looks at. Uh, electric supply is another. How do we continue uh, to provide uh, reliable electricity going forward? There's been a lot of talk, especially after our last few storms, with undergrounding, uh, microgrids, uh, and changing the supply over to natural gas and making sure that we have enough energy going forward. Uh, the plan discusses this uh, in some detail. I won't get into that, uh, but that is one portion of the plan. Uh, same along the idea of industrial energy needs. And then transportation discusses some of the new platforms for vehicles, whether it be uh, hydrogen, fuel cell cars, electric, or natural gas, and how we create a platform to be able to support those types of vehicles. And we should say the plan was released last year. It's gone through a hearing process around the state, uh, something that DEEP has run uh, over the last several months, and now is being presented to the legislature uh, over the next few months with uh, hopeful passage of several, several of the points that are listed inside the energy strategy. John? As, as you look at the next slide, you kind of see, as economic developers, what our challenge is. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, uh, the focus of the plan, I apologize, is uh, getting natural gas uh, to Connecticut customers. The next slide, I'll address what I just said. I, I apologize. Uh, previously, our gas came from the Gulf Coast. And as a result, the cost of natural gas in Connecticut made it uncompetitive. As you'll see shortly, with the discovery of the Marshallis Shale fines, the gas is now close to our marketplace. Uh, and, and by all expert opinions, that price uh, uh, should remain level for the foreseeable future. Garrett will speak in a little bit about some of the risks to that projection. But most experts believe uh, that it is, uh, in fact, decoupled uh, from uh, fuel, uh, oil fuel, and that it would remain level and low for the foreseeable future. Uh, in the governor's plan, uh, there are six focus areas, uh, environmental benefits, and we'll speak to those, uh, energy efficiency, uh, uh, business competitiveness, and we'll show you some graphs on that. It would create jobs. It would reflect uh, investments. As it is uh, in most of your communities, uh, Garrett's company or my company is in all likelihood in the top 10 taxpayers in your communities. And uh, uh, additional investments would only solidify that position. Uh, economic impact, and that would, uh, that would be the job creation and investments. And then as a country and as uh, a state and even communities, it, it puts us in uh, closer to uh, energy independence. And for the average residential customer, it would result in $1,800 in annual savings. So uh, that is attractive. Now moving to the next slide, uh, which I, I tried to get you to uh, out of order. Uh, but uh, when you look at Connecticut, and as economic developers, we are concerned about what our competitive advantage is or disadvantage. Presently, and we'll show you the numbers, 
natural get the uh, lack of availability uh, and the cost uh, is uh, it has made us un, un, uh, uncompetitive with the neighboring states. So when you look at New Jersey and New York, New Jersey with a, uh, a gas penetration of 72%, uh, uh, just to our, uh, our west, New York at 53%, Connecticut being at 31%, puts us, us at a disadvantage. Now moving to the right, when you look at uh, how people are heating in Connecticut, uh, we're at 50% for uh, heating oil. And as you uh, notice the uh, notes there, the U.S. average for heating oil is 7%. Moving to the, and you can see uh, to a lesser degree, uh, the natural gas, which we already described, electric heat and propane. Moving to the next slide, <coughs> this map uh, might be a little difficult to see, although I don't think so, because as you uh, understand the map of the United States and you see that large uh, pink orange uh, mass of uh, Marcellus shale. Uh, it's a real game changer. Uh, most expert, experts believe that that reflects a hundred year supply and it's the nation's largest gas field. So in the past, as you can see on the map of the United States, that the gas was coming from the deep south and now with the proximity to New England, we have a real opportunity. When you look over to the right side of the screen, you see what uh, I, I alluded to earlier is the decoupling. It used to be that oil and natural gas would follow pretty much the same trend and cost line. But with the discovery of the Marshallis shale and the technology to extract that natural gas, uh, experts believe that uh, uh, this, this cost uh, would remain low, lower for uh, out, out 10 years and maybe beyond. And, and when you start to factor in what this price differential means for, for natural gas, um, what we've seen is as much of a 65% of a lower cost uh, than heating oil at times over the last couple of years. That fluctuates as the prices change, uh, but generally between 50 and 65% lower. 70 to 80% lower for people who heat with propane and 75% lower than heating with electric. And I, I can say that I had electric heating a few years ago, and, and the price was just ridiculous. I've switched to natural gas and, and cut my costs down uh, significantly. Uh, it is important to note, I think one of the, the questions that people first ask when they hear this, though, is you know, what guarantees do we have that this is going to last, that this is going to stay? And frankly, there are none. Um, and there are several risks out there, but uh, we think given the amount of discovery that there is, and not just us, but the experts believe that the prices will stay stable at these differentials uh, for years to come. But, I mean, uh, just briefly to run through some of the risks that are out there and how they're addressed, um, there is the question of uh, the environmental costs associated with natural gas. Uh, still a lot not known about fracking. Um, you hear different stories, different Internet uh, legends. Some may be true, some may not. Um, and I don't think anyone's fully gotten a grip on is there a environmental cost. Uh, from everything we've seen, it's, it's mostly in, in the transportation or how do uh, they bring the equipment into the area where they're going to do the fracking. Um, are they allowing the water that they use to do this fracking drilling process, are they allowing that to get on the surface or are they recapturing that after it's used? Um, so it seems more right now that the actual environmental costs are around the practices and some of the just industry standards that are used and are those uniform throughout. Um, does not seem like they are larger scale, but uh, we'll see. Um, as these natural gas prices have stayed at this level, electricity generators have turned their production over to natural gas away from coal um, and away from oil in running power plants. In fact, right now, natural gas is being used at the same rate as coal in the United States, and that's the first time that that's occurred. Um, and that's, that's helped reduce electric rates from what we were seeing in Connecticut at one point, the generation portion, just the portion of producing the power was around 12 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, and we're now down to 8 cents and maybe going below that. That is where you've seen, if you've seen that reduction in your electric bills 
over the last several years, it's this natural gas discovery that is running that. So as natural gas stays at these levels, more electric generators may be switching over, and that could also uh, affect pricing. So something to keep in mind. Um, also exports, uh, prices for these other fuels in other parts of the globe where they don't have this abundant supply of natural gas, uh, the price of natural gas, even if you shipped it, liquefied it, uh, could be potentially lower. Uh, so it creates a market where we may start exporting natural gas to other parts of the world and equalize the price with some of the other fuels. Um, and then also there is always the, the risk. There was a New York Times article a couple years ago about, you know, is the supply really what people say it is? So far, it has answered all the questions. The, the supply hasn't dipped. Uh, it's met the expectations that people had uh, going back even a couple of years ago as to how much there, how much gas is available. Um, so this doesn't seem to be the problem uh, that many thought maybe it would be. But again, these are all things to keep in mind, but every indicator that we've had is that these natural gas prices are here to stay. And to go into that a little bit more and look at it, the comprehensive energy plan does take this into, a, into account um, and even forecast some higher natural gas rates. And, and what they said is even if the natural gas high rate that they predicted were to go up 10 times, it wouldn't be until you get 10 times higher than that high level of gas rate uh, that some of the savings for residential users who are nearby main lines right now, uh, their conversion would then not be cost effective. So you're, you're looking at a very high watermark to get to uh, to make this plan uh, not effective. We'll go to the next slide and uh, talk a little bit more about those penetration targets that John uh, mentioned a little bit earlier uh, when he compared state by state. This breaks it down further in Connecticut residential customers, commercial customers, and industrial customers. Um, what's interesting to look at in the way that the plan uh, breaks down the state is into two segments, segment A and segment B. Segment A customers are those who are either right now near an existing line, so there would not be much cost to run a gas line to their house. Let's say that the gas line run down, runs down their street, um, or they already do have natural gas in their home, but they're only using it to cook. They have not switched over their furnace. Uh, segment A by just having segment A customers switch over to natural gas, and not even all of the potential ones, because we understand some people, for certain reasons, will not want to. Some, uh, there may be some structural issue with their home where they can't. Something may stop them from doing that. But if uh, two-thirds of segment A were to switch over, we would reach the penetration targets of, we've been discussing that 50% for residential customers, and then the 75% range for commercial and industrial. So that's not even getting into segment B, uh, which is where we're actually putting down new mainline expansions, which is an expensive process. We're talking about a uh, million dollars per mile to lay new gas piping uh, down and bring it to areas where currently there is no natural gas. But just to start to get Connecticut in line with other states, um, we would just have to reach out and, and do a better job of getting to some of those customers who are already on the the main gas lines. And I'll just talk briefly, and then we'll, we'll run through the last few slides quickly, but natural, a switch to natural gas is not an easy thing to do, uh, even if you are right on the main line. You face costs of changing your furnace over. Uh, maybe you just purchased a new furnace, oil furnace, five years ago, so obviously you have a lot more life on that furnace. Um, might not be cost effective for you today to tear that out and then put in a natural gas furnace. And, so usually there's only a limited window of opportunity when people want to switch, when their furnace is starting to get uh, older in life. You're looking at costs of around four to $5,000 for putting in uh, and buying a new furnace. Uh, you may have costs of removing the oil furnace, if oil is what you're heating with, uh, that drive that up to around $7,000 uh, per customer. And that's just for a customer who's right on the main line. Uh, we, in the gas business, if you are not right near a main line, and we actually have to run uh, an extension out to you that's more than 150 feet. Uh, 
we have a, a SEAC uh, uh, cost in aid of construction uh, where the customer actually pays in um, to have that new gas line added on. So you're looking at another potentially around $4,000 is the average on some of those costs. So it starts to get high. So a lot of, of what the plan is looking to do is change some of the regulatory structure in how that the gas companies can factor in these costs. Um, when the gas companies determine how much aid and construction money they'll get from a uh, resident, it's, used, it's done using a uh, 15 to 20 year vision of how much revenue is going to come in from this customer and then so how much do we have to ask the customer to pay in to get this gas service. Uh, one of the regulatory changes that the state is looking at is allowing the gas companies to not just look at what your usage would be over 10, 15, or 20 years, but extend that out to 25 years. Uh, right now, Massachusetts has a 33-year, uh, what they call hurdle rate, where they would look at the revenues that would come in from this new gas customer and then factor that in in deciding how much money the customer would have to pay to get the gas uh, out there. So that's one thing where just a regulatory change could change some of the cost variables. Uh, we'll move along to the next slide and just go through a few of these. Um, sorry for the pause there. We just saw that we had a few questions, but I think what we'll do is we'll wait till the end and we'll take the questions then. Um, on this slide here, this is just a few of, of the positive impacts. Uh, job creation, you, you'll hear a lot on the job creation number. Uh, Will there be jobs lost in oil companies who won't have people delivering oil? Likely, yes. If there's a massive switch to natural gas, there'll be uh, job losses there. Uh, but the plan has done some economic impacts uh, through the Department of Economic and Community Development. And uh, some of the projections they saw were 5,400 uh, net jobs per year in doing this expansion. That would be these installations. Uh, one thing that's been discussed is a lot of oil companies uh, some already are, are multi-fuel, where they also sell natural gas products. They put in furnaces for natural gas, and there's service related to that as well. Um, uh, economic impact, uh, we do expect there to be a, a major imp economic impact, not just for uh, the customers, but the laying down of, of this new uh, pipeline sales of, of new furnaces, uh, and so it could be seen as a boost for the economy. And then you also have environmental benefits that uh, natural gas uh, emits fewer emissions um, when used for heating. Trying to get through these next few slides so we can get to your uh, questions. But in this one, I, I did mention a few of these, uh, some of the hurdles that exist for more natural gas. We talked about the customer costs, a lot of upfront costs, uh, regulatory model, changing some of the structures in the way that the utilities uh, are able to justify their costs and then how much they have to pass on to the customer. And then the last one we, is, a, is a major issue and, and needs to be addressed, but uh, pipeline capacity, if we start using more natural gas in Connecticut at significant levels, uh, we likely will need more pipeline uh, access or capacity coming into the state. Currently, there's three major pipelines. Go to our next slide. As uh, as Garrett was saying, uh, changing the regulatory model uh, is not, and the governor says it in his plan. He's not picking the winner. What he's doing is he's trying to make uh, all fuel options available to Connecticut uh, uh, businesses and residents so that they can make good decisions. So. Uh, I don't believe that uh, what we're asking for in the regulatory modeling is uh, that gas be given an, an advantage. But as Garrett mentioned, and, and many times when there's a project in your community, uh, you'll be told by the prospect company, you know, I got an estimate from uh, CLMP, United Illuminating, uh, Yankee Gas, Connecticut Natural Gas, that I'm, I'm going to have to pay a cost to bring the service to my building. Uh, and those are dictated by regulations. And what the governor and uh, I believe uh, Commissioner Estes is trying to do is trying to make sure that uh, the, the regulatory policy doesn't 
preclude people from making the decision to move to natural gas. Now, uh, uh, the uh, 10 elements of the DEP's recommendation, and I think as uh, uh, planners, as economic developers, uh, this would be attractive to all of us, is, is to establish a planning process for natural gas expansion. And what the governor is trying to do is bring uh, those concerned about uh, energy, those concerned about the environment, and economic development to the table to establish good policy, good regulations uh, as we move forward. As Garrett said, <coughs> excuse me, gas does present a, uh, an opportunity for Connecticut to be competitive. So part of the plan is uh, to raise customer awareness and uh, uh, to actually uh, let folks know what the options are. Uh, and as John was saying, a lot of this is just on the gas company side, giving the gas companies more flexibility uh, to be able to serve customers. They are highly regulated companies. Uh, through Pura, through uh, the Department of Energy Environmental Protection. So a lot of it is financing mechanisms. Would the gas companies, uh, right now I can tell you at, at UI, something that we're able to do is with small businesses, uh, if you are going to do energy efficiency improvements on your small business, we're able to do 0% financing on your bill for making those changes, and then you pay for them as you're getting the savings from the energy efficiency. So the governor in this plan is looking at doing potential things like that where you can put some of the costs of the upfront customer costs on your bill and do financing through the gas companies so that it makes those upfront costs not all be upfront and paid for over time. Uh, also, some incentives to drive aggregation of the new uh, off-main customers, ways that we can look at um, doing sign-ups one one difficulty we have is if you have a, a neighborhood uh, and you have a, a couple of customers there who want to get gas, they want to get the gas line uh, extended to their neighborhood, it, it's quite a process to get everyone to sign up and commit that they are going to buy into getting this new gas line. Uh, it takes several months sometimes. People's lives of their furnace may change. Someone might have to move earlier to get a new furnace. Let's say they were... Uh, in a situation where they needed to get a new furnace over the summer. Um, so you have people dropping in, dropping off, uh, adding in. Uh, so the one, one way would be to create an incentive for people to sign up uh, to gain into uh, a pool and say, you know, we do want to have uh, gas extended here, uh, and then the financing mechanism so we can make that possible and, and lower the cost uh, to the customer that they would have to pay. The governor also envisions uh, uh, that good energy policy would actually create an economic development fund, and what the plan calls for is to establish a green bank, a first of its kind in the nation, that would combine public-private uh, uh, capital for people to do innovative uh, projects in Connecticut. Also, moving to the next slide, uh, th there would be an extension, similar to what you see on the electric side, uh, would be incentives to encourage high-efficiency uh, furnaces. And, and this is where we get at uh, uh, reducing uh, the environmental impact of our, our, our energy policy in Connecticut. Okay, and uh, again, a lot of this we already talked about, change the regulatory model to reduce some of those uh, upfront costs and then uh, potentially even a, a rate writer so that instead of paying those upfront costs, um, those costs are extended throughout the uh, life of the furnace. So you, you're not paying the construction costs on day one. You're paying it with your monthly bill. Okay. And then uh, uh, the plan would also, uh, and we, we've touched on this as we went through regulatory but to uh, reduce the cost of equipment conversions and main extensions. Uh, for those of you out there in communities, that would be lowering the cost of those contributions in aid of construction when we are extending lines. And then uh, there is a, a concern. I went to some of the hearings, uh, the pure hearings that were held around the state, and there is a real concern uh, from the uh, oil, uh, oil fuel delivery companies and service companies that there would be displaced workers. Now, uh, Garrett touched on the economic modeling that DECD did around this plan, and it would be a net job creator, uh, but there could be displaced workers, and I believe that the plan 
<coughs> is very sensitive uh, to displaced workers where they would provide training so that they could get involved in this new market, uh, whether it would be actually doing the conversions and the ongoing service work. So uh, that is it for the uh, 10 elements of the plan. And then we'll uh, uh, just run through the quantifiable benefits again. Yeah, I just we have this summary up here. That we talked about the job creation. Those, uh, the DCD uh, numbers that, that uh, came out of the model that they put together were, were 54,000 jobs over the 10 years. Um, you know, if depending on the different levels of how much conversion is done, those numbers fluctuate. Um, so take them with what you what you want. I know there is controversy over, you know, uh, oil dealers and uh, how many construction jobs will be created. Um, but there will be new jobs created by putting in more natural gas. And again, this is really just giving customers a choice. Right now, to change to natural gas, there are a lot of hurdles. Uh, it's still up to the customer whether they want to have oil or natural gas. Um, we do see an economic impact by more people switching over to gas. And the biggest part of that will be savings that customers would have and then can use in the economy however they choose, whether they want to save that money that they get from that bill or they invest it back into the economy. And then business competitiveness, as you can see, uh, based on the modeling, uh, businesses would save $215 million a year. Uh, as you know, if companies had capital to put back into production, uh, that, could, that would result in jobs and, and future investments uh, in our, our communities. And uh, Garrett and I, just before we began the presentation, did a, we had a little uh, conversation. He's a gas heat uh, uh, customer, and I'm a... Uh, a, a fuel oil customer, and I'm paying about twenty dollars a square foot to heat my house last month, and he paid about ten dollars a square foot to heat his house. So uh, you you expand that to businesses, and you see how uh, they can save money. The other thing is is that I, I'm 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 I, I'm forced to think or I think about Brazil. It was a country that decided that. Uh, uh, it, it was a country that decided it was going to achieve energy independence. I do think uh, Connecticut, the United States of America, uh, stands the possibility of moving towards energy independence. As you can see, uh, if we take advantage of the gas fines in our own country, we'd be able to reduce by uh, uh, significant uh, millions of barrels in de decreased uh, fuel oil consumption, which by and large come from overseas. And uh, the environmental benefits, which we touched on, but I, I do think it's worth uh, touching on here, uh, close to a, a million tons of greenhouse gas emissions would be reduced each year, uh, which uh, when you look at air quality in Connecticut, and in particular in some of our populated areas, uh, this could make uh, natural gas expansion, expansion uh, quite attractive. And that concludes our presentation. Uh, we we have a few questions, and if any of oh okay, we um I see one hand raised. I'm gonna unmute you, Tom, and see if you have a question. Tom, are you there? Yes, I am here. Um, I guess my question was, um, as far as developers go, are are we reaching out to developers and uh, for say like new residential, um. Uh, projects. Um, are we um, trying to make sure that they put gas mains where they're available, where they're near a gas main, to put a gas main in the street? Um, uh, or are these developers, uh, some of these developers, still loyal to some of the oil companies? I don't know if you guys have a feel on that. I, I guess it might be up to the sales teams to try to reach out to these developers, but I don't know how, if you guys have a, any comments on that. I'd be happy to take a, a, a crack at that time. And by the way, if our answers don't satisfy you, uh, please either send uh, uh, Courtney or Garrett or I a follow-up email, and we'll get you the best answer we possibly can. Uh, our gas uh, people are very different than our Yankee, uh, say, account executives. Uh, they meet with their towns and their building inspectors uh, almost weekly, know what's coming in, and try to try to make uh, uh, 
uh, any developer aware of what the possibilities are for gas expansion and if the conversation uh, brings, you know, if the gas is close enough, they tend to do it. But to get at the uh, regulatory issue, to a great extent, people who, who could get gas have gotten gas or are in the midst of getting gas. But it's, it's how do we bring it uh, beyond where it's in place right now is, is the purpose of this. But uh, my sense is, is that uh, in, in, uh, at Yankee Gas, uh, speaking for them, but I, I, I know folks at CNG and Southern, uh, they're all pretty uh, aggressive about trying to capture that new load, those new sales. Uh, I guess we can start, uh, seems like James had a few questions, and I'm not sure that we can answer all of them right here, uh, but we, we can take shots. I was looking up into the actual plan. I should mention, too, the actual comprehensive energy plan is available at the uh, DEEP website, uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. We'll try to get you that uh, URL in a few minutes, but uh, if, if you just type in Connecticut Deep uh, in Google, you should make it to their website. Uh, and the last time I was there, they had a link to the energy plan uh, right on the main homepage. Um, so I was just looking through that to answer this question about uh, CO2 comparison. Um, and Oh, they can't. Okay, I'm sorry. We have a few questions here. One of the questions uh, was, what is the CO2 comparison between oil and natural gas? So let me just, uh, you, let me just read to you briefly here what we have. Uh, natural gas produces less air pollution when burned than other fossil fuels. Um, Connecticut is already seeing air pollution benefits from switching. Uh, let's see. Burning natural gas instead of fuel oil for heating or in place of gasoline or diesel fuel for transportation can reduce emissions of NOx by 20 to 50 percent and SOx by up to 99 percent, uh, can reduce CO2 emissions by up to 25 to 27 percent. So I hope that answers uh, the question about CO2 comparisons uh, between the two. Um, Let's see, can a homeowner install their own gas appliance, or they, do they need to hire a contractor uh, with a special license? I'm not sure if there's an actual regulation on the books about that, but I, w I would say that you should hire a uh, certified person to install the, this equipment. Uh, natural gas, while it is safe, uh, is not something that you want to be uh, messing around with yourself uh, trying to put in. As far as the safety of, there were questions about the safety of natural gas, uh, you know, and there was a, a story of uh, a crime in Missouri this past summer where there was a significant explosion. It turned out it was a crime that actually caused the explosion. It wasn't the, the safe use and installation of natural gas. So those are those are our concerns that consumers will have, and, and that would be their decision. All we're saying is, is that, they should have that decision. And as you know, many communities uh, in, in Connecticut have natural gas, and uh, it, it is safe, safely distributed and used daily uh, throughout the state of Connecticut. There was uh, some other questions about the cost of conversion, and does that include making sure that the chimney and uh, all the other parts of the house are within code? Uh, the estimates that uh, Garrett shared during our presentation reflect all-in cost of conver uh, average cost of converting a household. So those conversions, as Garrett touched on, I'll touch on it again, should be done by a licensed, experienced, reputable uh, installer, and uh, they should be done in compliance with all local business codes or building codes. Yeah, and I, I can share my own experience uh, here. When I had my uh, gas furnace installed about a year and a half ago, contact the gas company. Uh, they come out, they identify where is the line in proximity to your uh, home or business. Is there going to be a cost in running that gas line to you? Uh, in my case, the gas line was right in the street. Uh, you sign a contract with the gas company that they that within six months of them putting in the equipment that uh, you will uh, use it, you will have uh, your equipment in place and you'll be using gas. The gas company uh, put, comes in, puts in the line, and puts in a meter right to your home. Uh, 
during this time, uh, at the same time or before, you start working with a contractor to come in, uh, put in the furnace system and the actual the, the line that runs from the meter uh, into the building. In my case, uh, the cost was $4,800 for the uh, installation with the, the contractor I worked with. They put in a, a high efficiency uh, furnace. They did all of the installation of the piping from the meter uh, up into uh, my attic, into the furnace. Um, they did any uh, switching that had to be done electrically uh, or anything that uh, had to be done uh, with the thermostat uh, as far as having the air conditioning system and all that in there uh, and also uh, anything that had to be do done as far as duct work. Uh, and then they also put in, uh, they also ran a line inside my house into my uh, stove and hooked up a gas stove. So that was the all-in cost. Um, you know, we always recommend if you're if you're going forward with this, shop around for you, through a few different contractors. Uh, have them come in, uh, tell you what they what they can do, what they uh, see the cost being, any cost overruns that they could see, so you get a full picture of it. Um, but generally, uh, they're very effective, and and my experience has been good with it. There was a another question we're seeing here uh, about the operation of the Middletown plant. Uh, the clean energy plant uh, did have a uh, uh, an explosion uh, during the testing phase of its construction. I, I believe that uh, uh, you know there are ongoing lawsuits, and I'm not an expert in the lawsuit, nor am I an attorney. Uh, but there are are lawsuits ongoing about that explosion. Uh, it seems to be unfortunate. They were actually testing for leaks with volatile gas, uh, which uh, caused that explosion and there were people still working in the plant with open torches. So that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, they were able to, within about a year, get that plant uh, completed after that uh, mishap and uh, it is now uh, contributing low-cost energy onto the grid here in Connecticut. I think we've answered uh, see, I, I don't have the BTU comparison. Someone was asking about that. that. Um, we can try to look into that if, uh, if you want us to. Uh, there are plans to extend gas to unserved areas. Uh, you know, if you look at the map of Connecticut's gas service right now, it essentially follows uh, the interstate highways. Um, and that's unfortunate for people who live outside of those areas. And and that is, is part of the idea of this. How, how do we get gas uh, to those underserved areas? Part of it is identifying anchor users, uh, whether it's a large public building or a large uh, industrial building. Um, they would have the amount of usage that would make it more cost effective to run the additional line from wherever the, the main line is to where that, that facility is. And once you run that main line, now it's going to be cheaper to start serving all the residences, the smaller businesses that are between that large anchor user and the main line. Part of what's in the plan is potentially creating a, a, a Department of Economic and Community Development Fund that would incentivize for a large, let's say, industrial user uh, some of the cost associated with running that new pipeline extension, that main line extension, which we told you was uh, in the range of a million dollars a mile uh, when you start putting that down. You know, another part that kind of plays into this, but is actually in some ways separate from the plan, um, is we've talked a lot about microgrids in the last uh, year or two. That would be in some ways creating a power island uh, in the scenarios where we have uh, large power outages. Towns have been going around identifying what portion of their town, what, Perhaps it's a, a large gym or a school where they could shelter people if there was a full power outage in Connecticut. And by having uh, natural gas running to that area and then having a, a fuel cell or a natural gas generator there, they would have power. Well, if these, some of these plans go forward and those, some of those would be funded through either federal or state dollars, but in the, in the realm of emergency preparedness, 
Uh, that would then extend gas lines, and then that would open up a whole new corridor of people who are near that main gas line uh, that runs to those people. So extending it out into these underserved areas is a major part of the bill, or of the plan, which uh, we expect to go into a bill during this legislative session. As, as uh, There is a question here, do all appliances uh, have a pilot light? Uh, in my understanding, they do. Uh, to the gentleman asking this question, I, what I'm going to do, because uh, I, I do want to get back to you also on the BTU question, I will uh, contact you uh, out in your area. We have a, a great representative who can answer uh, all of your questions. I will follow up with you. Uh, for anyone who has questions, uh, my email uh, or ongoing questions, my email is pretty easy. It's john.otool at nu.com and just leave the apostrophe off so you can type that all in uh, lowercase but john.otool at nu.com and uh, I will get one of our gas experts out to meet with you the gentleman in Wyndham and any other community that uh, has uh, uh, ongoing questions or uh, outstanding questions. And if you, if you do have gas usually what uh, what I have in my home other people have is um, you can get one of these uh, just like a smoke detector, uh, gas, and, and usually they're gas and carbon monoxide detectors at the same time, which is a, a good thing to have. Um, and they're very sensitive, and if there was anything, any kind of problem, um, usually you would know about it by having one of those installed in your home. It's just uh, 20 or $30. Um, and the gas companies do take leaks very seriously. I know uh, actually all the trucks have uh, leak sensing equipment installed so that they're Always as they're driving around, they're driving the main lines to make sure that there's no gas leaks in that. So it's, I mean, this is an industry that's been around uh, for a long time. We're just seeing this expansion right now. But natural gas has been heating homes for decades now, and, and there haven't been uh, major safety problems. Yeah, I, I, I should add, and I, I left it out, but a lot of the new high-efficiency high furnaces actually don't have uh, gas burning, so they don't have the pilot light. So I think as we're looking towards more efficiency, we're not keeping that uh, that ongoing burning uh, with, through the pilot light. So, but uh, we we can get you uh, whatever detailed answers you may need. I don't see any other questions, um, so we're going to wrap it up. We're right on time. Thank you so much to Garrett and John for all of this information. I know as an economic developer in a town. Um, that's going to be really good information for me to have for my businesses who want to do this. Um, yeah, so. You know, and, and as going forward, a lot of this right now is just a plan. So uh, if you think that this is something that uh, you would like to support and that uh, would be beneficial for your community, uh, we encourage you to talk to your legislators. Uh, we do expect that over the next uh, few weeks um, there will be uh, legislation that will be coming out that will incorporate um, the governor's plan into bills uh, and would expect it to go up for votes uh, later in this legislative session. So I, I would say, and if you have more questions and want to know more information, to talk with your town uh, or talk with your legislator, please let us know. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, everyone. Take care.